Okay, so we got here it is six o'clock and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, do a couple of housekeeping items and then um, we'll go from there. So my name is uh, Kenton McAllister and I'm the physician liaison that covers Eastern Central Washington and uh, Idaho and Montana and I'm on point tonight. So uh, I'll be uh, hosting the event along with uh, a colleague, uh, Don Riley, who will be assisting me with uh, questions in the Q&A. So we have 95 RSVPs for tonight's program, so it's definitely a very popular topic. So really appreciate um, Matt and Sophie providing this. So the title of the program is called Integrated Behavioral Health and Brief Fast Interventions in Pediatric Care, Anxiety, Behavior, Depression, Parenting, Teens, and Trauma. Um, and then the objectives, um, they're going to overview, um, Sophie mainly will overview the Seattle Children's Care Network and uh, Seattle Children's Integrated Behavioral Health Program Learning Collaborative. She'll, she'll present that for about 15, 20 minutes. And then afterwards, Nate will talk about the five available FAST or first approach skills um, uh, training FAST programs for anxiety, behavior, depression, parenting, teens, and trauma. And uh, so the, the FAST program are designed to provide brief evidence-based behavioral therapy for youth and families with common mental health concerns in settings such as primary care clinics or schools where longer term treatment is not typically provided. And at the end of the program, everyone should get an email that states um, that will ask for uh, an evaluation. We encourage you to do this, shouldn't take more than two minutes. And uh, that will also be presented in the chat box at the end of the program, but also on your email. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce, introduce both Sophie and Matt at this time. Um, Sophie King has a, um, is a program manager for the Seattle Children's Care Network Integrated Behavioral Health Program. Sophie leads the Integrated Behavioral Health Program supporting pediatric primary care practices that implement integrated care programs within their practices and managing resources to support the behavioral health needs of youth and their families across the network. In her spare time, Sophie enjoys hiking, um, trying out new recipes in local restaurants and cheering on the many Seattle sports teams. Thank you, Sophie, for, for being here tonight. Um, we'll go ahead and introduce uh, Nate. Um, now, Nate Youngbluth um, is a PhD in clinical and is a clinical psych, um, psychologist. He's co-director of FAST programs in the partnership Access Line or PALS. Um, Nate serves as a trainer, consultant, treatment developer, and researcher for projects at Seattle Children's Hospital, Harborview Medical Center, and the University of Washington School of Mental Health Assessment Research Training, or the SMART Center. Nate helps lead two statewide evidence-based practice training initiatives, the Washington FAST initiative, um, focused on integrated primary care, and the Washington CBT Plus training initiative supporting the community mental health. Nate enjoys getting outdoors with his family. He can often be found playing sports with his son, um, gardening, making music, and feeding treats to his backyard chickens. So, and he has a quote, and that, that kind of leads to exactly what we'll be talking tonight. Um, this is a quote by Nate. It says, one way to fight disparities is to bring evidence-based treatment strategies into the places where kids and families are. And I think that's the, a, a goal of Nate and Sophie to do that. And so we appreciate them. Um, we'll start with uh, Sophie, who will present for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll switch over to Nate. Um, the, we'll have Q&A, and if you could just write your questions in the chat box, and if you could address it to the panelists, and that way both uh, Sophie and Nate will see the questions. Um, we've decided it'd be best because uh, it, will, it will be a robust discussion that we think we'd want to take the questions at the end of uh, Nate's presentation for both Sophie and Nate, um, but we'll have them collectively and Don Riley will uh, assist with the 
reiterating the question. So um, without any uh, further ado, we'll go ahead and turn the time over to, to Sophie. Thank you, Sophie. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction and for having me here tonight. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you all about the uh, program that we've been working on with the Seattle Children's Care Network and Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, I had the pleasure of joining this team this past fall, so I've been here for a little more than a year, but previously I've been at Seattle Children's in different areas of our mental health programs for over 10 years now. So our inpatient behavioral health unit, um, our emergency department, crisis services, outpatient services. I have been, um, I've had the pleasure of working at kind of at every different level of our continuum of services. And I was just really excited to get into primary care, to get really upstream um, into this early identification, early interventions, and then be able to really have an impact on the whole system. So like I said, excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, just real briefly, what we're going to go over today, really high level about the Seattle Children's Care Network, and then just a little bit about our program, a little overview of how we started, how we're measuring success, um, where we're at right now, and the impact this program has had so far. And as Kenton mentioned in the beginning, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll wait till after, after the second presentation and then come back, but feel free to add those if any come up. Okay, so to jump right in uh, for the Seattle Children's Care Network, like I said, really high level overview. We are a clinically integrated network that's owned by Seattle Children's and includes 16 primary care practices across the Puget Sound area. Um, so you can see some, some stats here on the screen, but I'm really, really excited to be able to serve patients, families, kids across a, a lot of different communities with a range of different needs, um, more uh, rural, urban, we kind of span a lot in this network, so it's really interesting to be a part of. Diving more into our integrated behavioral health program, uh, this is a timeline. I'm not going to go through every single step. I just wanted to uh, show this visual to really talk about there's a lot of different pieces that went into this work to make this all possible. We've had a, a strong leadership working on this for, for several years now and really in close partnership with a lot of the programs over at Seattle Children's, including the PAL um, team, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So that, that's uh, a team that we're fortunate to partner and collaborate with a lot. But what I really wanna highlight here is we've, we've had um, generous funding from multiple different sources, including an award from Seattle Children's, but also commercial payers. A couple of the large MCOs have all um, funded uh, this work, which has allowed us to be to grow incrementally as we have received this additional funding. So we started with a launch of six practices in 2020, and then we're able to add six more in 2021. And as we've received additional funding, we've been able to launch additional services in terms of care navigation. So it's really exciting to be able to support um, lots of different aspects of behavioral and health. Um, looking at our uh, integrated behavioral health care model, this pyramid really shows the multiple levels of support for behavioral health needs for youth and families. Uh, what's interesting is we actually started at the top here with implementing the IBH programs. And so when I say that, I mean really practices that have an embedded therapist on site in their pediatric primary care office. Um, and, and that was because we had kids who are, were identified with these behavioral health needs who were struggling to get evidence-based care treatments in their communities. So we started with those programs, um, but it, it really is just the, the tip of the iceberg here. Um, we know there are so many patients uh, or kids, families that need additional support, additional resources in addition to this uh, level of care. Uh, and and not every practice uh, has an embedded therapist. So what we're looking at as we expand down this um, pyramid is for care management, talking about support when, when kids have multiple providers out in the community. Maybe they have a therapist at one agency and a psychiatrist at a different place. So having, having a team that really helps wrap around and support them navigation services. I'm sure I don't need to explain to any of you all, but finding resources in the community 
is just a huge task. It is a complex system for families to have to navigate. So having being able to offer some assistance and support there is, is really important. And then um, screenings, truly getting upstream, universal behavioral health screenings is, is our goal. Uh, so looking at this, um, we are continuing to add more services, more resources as we as we can, and, and really trying to meet the uh, needs of all the different kids where they're at. So then looking at our IVH program a little more closely, uh, our IVH, the our program goal is really focused on three things. So it's trainings, it's screenings, and it's the services on site. So for trainings, we know that our providers in our primary care settings, as you all know, they're working with kids every day that may have behavioral concerns. Kids are coming in, uh, and whether you have a therapist on site or not, primary care providers are having a lot of conversations, um, getting a lot of questions about these topics. So we wanted to make sure that we are providing some education, some evidence-based tools, some language, some skills to use um, when, when we're having these conversations. And uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad we're partnered with FAST here today. We'll talk a little more about some of those um, interventions later on and some of the trainings that we've done. But that that is one really big piece of, of what we've been doing. Um, Next is screenings. So to really get upstream, to get into preventive care, we need that early detection piece, as, as you all know. And then the services on site, with that early detection comes early intervention. We wanna be able to see the patients when appropriate, right there in the community without having to refer out. Um, also, just a little note here about what our program has included for the practices that have been participating. Um, there's some implementation support, ongoing coaching, some upstart funding, um, ongoing training opportunities. We we just want to acknowledge here that it takes a lot to start a program like this within a practice. Um, and while we're offering support, the, our, our practices are really, they're really doing a lot to get these up and running. Um, and to acknowledge them, and I, we may even have some on the line here. I haven't been able to check the participants too closely, but we have, like I mentioned, the six practices that started in 2020 and then six more in 2020. 2021. I don't need to explain to you all how this has been a really busy time, right? It's been a really tough couple of years to be launching new initiatives, starting new programs, and with all the different competing needs, we've really seen a lot um, of progress, a lot of things that have been started and implemented, and that is because we work with teams that are just really dedicated to supporting these behavioral health needs, knowing that these patients are here and they need the care. Um, so glad, glad um, to be able to work with all of them. And then we are part of a, it's part of a larger uh, learning collaborative with some local, uh, excuse me, some local teams, but also some teams um, across the country. And it's just been really, really wonderful to collaborate, hear what other teams have been doing, what's working, what challenges are out there. So just sharing this as both a, both a recognition as well as a, um, want to show how 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 many how many people are involved in it and it takes to learn through all this um to get into some of our evaluation i am showing this this is how we are looking at our is this program successful so right now i've highlighted the short term goals um, because within the first couple of years of our program we're still really looking at these short-term metrics and the next couple of years we'll be looking at more of the intermediate and long term but right now we, we're looking at as I mentioned, trainings, screenings, and these services. Um, also just wanna pause here and acknowledge if anyone has been doing a program like this, they I'm sure it's well understood, but there's a lot of energy that goes into tracking, um, creating systems to track all this data, to submit it. We are fortunate at the SCCN to have a really robust analytics team um, that can insist and analyze all of this data, but for the practices to be able to document things in the EMR, all of our practices have different EMR systems. There's a lot that goes into this. And it's, well, it's really important to be able to have this data to show out, um, to show you all and to show others involved. Um, I just want to acknowledge that that it's a, bit, a big lift both uh, for us and for the practices. Um, all right, so with that said, let's look at some of it real briefly. Um, there's a lot going on here on this slide, but this I brought this dashboard to really talk about highlight the trainings piece that the first part of the goal and uh, we broke this down into several different areas which we'll briefly look at but that's the 
implementation trainings, these are one-time trainings that we offer for a practice within the first year, year or two that they have started their program to learn about various aspects of integrated care, different care models, um, financial sustainability, uh, a lot of different topics. Our support forums, that's where we're going into more of that ongoing continuing education. Um, those are things that are completely optional, but we want to offer to primary care providers as well as other roles to just keep, keep learning about new things. And if we're hearing that there's a lot of questions around a certain area, whether it's a certain diagnosis or treatment, that we're able to respond to that and offer kind of ongoing trainings. And then our clinic calls, we offer clinic specific calls where we meet with each clinic individually. In the first year, we're meeting with uh, some of our practices once or twice a month. Um, as we move into the second year and beyond, some of our programs that are really more stable have been able to cut down to maybe every other month or maybe quarterly. But we have recognized that there are there's a lot of challenges in this work. And so we have some practices that we're definitely still meeting with monthly. Um, there's a lot of building to do to make uh, to implement these programs, but then also to sustain them, especially around um, the workforce and, and hiring. I'm sure as you all have seen in your practices, there's a lot of turnover. So the, providing that ongoing support is really important to us um, to be able to support our practices. And then the last thing I want to highlight here on this page is this just this little box of the total training hours of over one year. And this just shows, you know, this I wanted to acknowledge this is a big ask, you know, for a primary care provider, 17 hours of training in a, in a year. That's a lot. You know, if you're being taken off of patient care specifically with some other optional training. So this is just acknowledging once again that there is a lot that goes into this work and while it's really great to be able to offer all this, we know it's a big lift and we want to support that however we can so that once we have these programs up and running, they're able to be successful and sustainable. Uh, just to keep moving, so the previous slide really called out the number of trainings, the hours of training. So this slide, I'm trying to go into a little more depth of the impact of these trainings. So this is looking at the first cohort. And what we did is we had all of the primary care providers fill out a survey um, with some various questions about how comfortable they were managing different aspects of behavioral health care on different age groups, different you know diagnoses, different, um, different spectrum of things going on. But the blue bars here are the baseline, and then the orange bars are post-assessment. So those were taken nine months later. And what we were able to see here is that in most of the categories, we did have a significantly uh, sorry, a statistically significant increase. Um, so this is one of the ways we're measuring, are these trainings successful? Um, are, are we providing the right uh, in the right amount, the right type? Um, so this is one piece of data that we have to report back on. And then next would be looking at those services uh, themselves. So once again, these are the same five practices um, in our first cohort. And this is uh, on the top, we're looking at the total number of patients seen, and then the bottom half, it's the number of visits. But as you can see, so this orange bar is our this past fiscal year. So October, and this data is only through June 30th. But you can see we hit you know, almost 2,000 patients here that were seen within their primary care setting. And then when we look at visits, um, we're about 6,500. Um, but when we were looking uh, per practice on the average, kids were having about four visits each, um, which means that we were really staying true to this brief intervention model, which we'll, we'll talk more um, about later on. But I, I, I just really wanted to call this out as you know, 2,000 kids that were being able to be seen within their clinics those are kids that would have been referred out to the community most likely. You know, they needed some sort of treatment. Um, and we all know there's just not enough resource in the community to see all these kids. So seeing them in their primary care creates space in the system overall for kids with higher acuity or different needs um, that have, have um, less availability, available options. And we also know that when we refer kids out in the community, many of them won't actually ever be seen. Maybe they'll be on wait lists. Maybe there won't be the follow-up. 
Um, and we, we know if they continue to worsen, uh, it may lead to them going to an emergency department or something if they you know, are in a crisis, they don't have access to treatments, and that, that's all potentially avoidable. And so that's really what we're here for is being able to meet kids where they're at, see them um, where they already receive services, where they're already comfortable. And we've gotten feedback from families about how important, it, how supportive it feels to be able to go to the clinic that they're familiar, they know where it is, they know where they're going, to be able to get treatment on site has just been really, really great um, and part of what we're doing here. So that, that with that, that is what all I had today was to give this overview of, of, our, of our program and what we've done so far. I'm excited as we keep moving and we'll have a, a second cohort as well, we'll have more data to report, like I said, on those screenings, on the trainings, on the visits and patients that we're able to see in primary care. But if you have any questions about our, about our services, about what we're doing, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will answer that after, after the second part. But with that, I will go ahead and stop sharing and, and, and pass it over, but thank you all once again. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so fun to be partnered with you in this work and to see um, the beginnings of the, the data to show um, where things are headed. Uh, I'm going to share my slides here. Like Kenton said, I'm uh, Nat Youngblood. I'm a clinical psychologist with the Partnership Access Line and the co-director of the uh, FAST programs and the lead developer of several of the FAST programs. I'm so excited to be, uh, to be here with you all today and to share with you some free um, easy to use resources that hopefully can um, help you as you support kids and teens and families in your practice with mental health concerns. Um, let me just first share, we don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose, and I just want to acknowledge and appreciate the funding that's come from the Washington Healthcare Authority, as well as some funding from NIMH that has helped us be able to do this, uh, develop these tools and do this work. Um, so FAST stands for First Approach Skills Training, um, and um, these are really, these programs are designed to be brief interventions for primary care settings, to be really the first step in care, and we design them by um, uh, adapting longer evidence-based programs and really trying to hone them down to those core essential active ingredients uh, wherever we could. Um, and they're being used in a lot of settings in Washington and, uh, and also in other places uh, that I'll tell you a little bit about. And we're currently supporting five different programs. So there's anxiety, behavior, depression, parenting teens, and trauma. Early childhood is soon to be released, and Fast Safety is another um, program that's in development, and we're being really careful to, um, uh, to build that one and do research uh, before rolling it out. So that's a little bit... Um, it's uh, going to be slower to roll out, but you can anticipate that, that coming. And these programs are designed, all of them, to be deliverable within four sessions. Um, and they are workbook guided. Uh, and the idea with the workbooks is that they're super easy to learn and use. And providers can really just open them up with families and read them together. And they'll be providing uh, really great evidence-based treatment. Um, now, most providers, most behavioral health providers who are delivering these four session or these, these um, fast interventions are not doing them in four sessions, right? Much more common is that in practices where they have brief behavioral support, um, that they're, they're setting limits of two months, three months, even six months. The idea is to have a brief course of care, but almost nobody in the real world that we're working with um, is setting such a strict limit. So the way it's often uh, sort of uh, delivered is, is flexible. And uh, the parameters of care in different practices is quite variable. Some of them are doing 20 to 30 minute visits. Others are doing sort of standard therapy hours. Uh, and um, we've tried to design our workbooks to meet the needs uh, and be flexible to those different parameters. Uh, and we've really adapted these um, programs, uh, iterated probably hundreds of times on the different programs to really take the feedback from our primary care partners to um, to make these programs fit for their settings and their needs. Uh, and in many cases, the programs are directly the result of requests from our partners to create tools for the needs that they're seeing. Um, I'll talk about our streamlined training. Because we made these programs so easy to deliver, uh, we really minimize the prep time by having things you, you just open and read and, and use together. Um, we're also able to train in a much more abbreviated way um, because uh, we've tried to make them so intuitive to use. And you can find all the materials I talk about for free on our website, seattlechildrens.org fast. <clears throat> 
So, um, you know, the programs are, are designed to address gaps that you know very well, um, that, you know, of course, most youth with mental health needs don't actually access care. That was bad before the pandemic. It's awful now. And we know that there are some communities that are especially underserved. Hey, hey, just so you know, we oh, lost okay. you for about 30 seconds. Oh, no. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you now, but about 30 seconds worth, we didn't hear you. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the gaps that we try to address with FAST programs are ones that you know really well, that um, most youth with mental health needs don't get access, and that was bad before the pandemic, and it's really bad now. And there are some communities that are especially underserved. And as Sophie was pointing out, when we refer out from primary care, it's well documented that oftentimes that doesn't result in care, right? The connection's not made, there's many barriers, uh, and, um, and it often doesn't result in the care that kids and families need. <clears throat> so, you know, with integrated care and with FAST especially, we're trying to create that access in a setting where there are relationships already, where the trust has been built, uh, and where in many cases there's less stigma and more willingness to come in. These programs are designed to be a first pass, and, um, and they're brief, right? Because we want to preserve, if you have a behavioral health clinician on staff, we want to make sure that they can serve the most folks in the most timely fashion. Um, a lot of times when practices um, don't plan for brief care, they hire a behavioral health person, they essentially recreate the, uh, the outpatient uh, community mental health system uh, with all of its challenges, and they fill up on almost immediately. And then when you have a family in your office and you want to get them care, they can't get in. So um, FAST is often delivered, like I said, in, in really brief format, uh, helps move, through, move families through the program, preserve access, and also if they're using those briefer visits, um, that allows for more families to be seen at a given time. Um, and we've strategically focused on the most common mental health concerns, and, and we're, we're trying to support you all in using these programs for mild to moderate concerns. Uh, if there's time, we can talk about how practices are using these programs for more severe or complex concerns, but really the goal is that those, those um, families can be seen in the community and that we can provide, um, hopefully upstream, right? In primary care, we can get upstream. You're really well positioned to catch those mild to moderate, especially if you're doing universal screening and give them the care that they need before they need a ton of resources to get their needs met. Okay, so FAST came from uh, the Washington State Legislature passed um, funding for a project that would be run out of PAL at Seattle Children's. And um, that was a pilot project that we conducted in the Tri-Cities. So we created brief versions of behavior problem and depression treatment, tested them out in Bent Benton and Franklin counties. And what we found was, um, and this, this was delivered in a sort of a regional resource model. So we actually hired um, and had staff in community mental health center settings. And we created a rapid referral pathway so that primary care practices in the region could quickly get folks in to these, these providers. And we found that the programs were great, that families were satisfied, but what we found was that those same barriers existed, right? Because we weren't embedded in the primary care clinics. And so many of the referrals weren't making it. Uh, many times their barriers intruded on the utilization of the program. It was being underutilized um, despite a uh, really great need. So we learned from that, we got permission from the healthcare authority to pivot, and we began offering fast training and case consultation for free around the state of Washington. And so starting in 2018, um, we began doing these free trainings, and it was sort of a bi-directional agreement here. The folks uh, who we trained and supported would give us feedback on the programs, and boy, did they ever. We um, have iterated these programs, like I said, um, so many times, and we've really transformed our vision for how these programs should be, how the materials need to look, uh, and, um, and really try to adapt them to the needs of uh, really diverse um, primary care settings. And so we continue to provide the training, the consultation, and we collaborate and we're doing some research that I can tell you a little bit about. Um, so our training approach, like I mentioned, is really, really brief. And so we offer two hour pre-recorded video trainings for all our programs. They're freely available on our website. I'll show you where they are. And so providers can go there and the video trainings for each program introduces the core concepts of how to support families with these, uh, these particular concerns and then walks through the treatment materials so that providers can feel really comfortable beginning to use them. That way they don't have to wait to get live training to be able to begin supporting families. Uh, and then we follow that with live trainings because we know that people learn really well with hands-on interactive trainings, role plays, uh, troubleshooting, 
Uh, and so th those live trainings are really important. We require the um, video trainings to occur beforehand so that they get that the basic information. And then we really focus on the hands-on practice and the live trainings. And we've been doing this for free for Washington State. As I said, uh, we are on the cusp of being able to offer this for out of state. So if you're uh, joining us from out of state, you can um, uh, look forward to hopefully being able to access this training soon. Um, <clears throat> We offer that ongoing consultation. So there are three of us, uh, myself and two other psychologists, staff these calls uh, every other week. And we have the behavioral health clinicians joining. They bring their case examples. They bring questions. They bring questions for me. They bring questions for each other. This is a really rapidly evolving, innovative space. And so there's a ton of creativity, a ton of um, uh, innovation. And it's, um, it's really exciting to be on those calls. We have currently about 30 clinicians around the state who join regularly. Um, and some of those have been joining since the very beginning in 2018, uh, and they are some of our um, most active and uh, uh, amazing partners. So you can see on this slide, these at the top are our stakeholder advisory committee members. Uh, they're folks who um, were some of our earliest and uh, most engaged partners, but we have actually many more that aren't listed here who are uh, super engaged and have been giving us uh, incredible collaboration and feedback. Um, and also lots of primary care providers who have given us their feedback. Um, and at the bottom, you can see our team. We have uh, myself and Aaron Gonzalez are the directors. We have a research director, Jen Blossom. We've got amazing partners um, who are uh, helping us uh, develop more materials and innovate and adapt them and test them uh, and do research. So um, this slide just shows the, the organizations, the primary care organizations around Washington State who have participated in at least some part of our training, either the online, the live, or the case consultation. And in almost all of these cases, I think people have done all three. Uh, and at this point, we've provided uh, live training to over 100 primary care-based clinicians in more than 30 clinics around the state. And uh, what's interesting is that we, our funding is really specific. It's for primary care and it's for Washington State only. And so we haven't been able to provide training and support to people in schools who also want brief interventions to create access to care or in community settings. But because our um, video trainings uh, allow people to get moving with the programs and they're available for free online, we actually, we can track that and we see that lots of school-based providers are doing these online trainings and using our brief, uh, easy to use tools. So uh, this is the list uh, that I pulled recently of folks who have um, uh, any organization that has had one or more um, providers uh, attending our trainings online. Uh, and then community-based providers uh, or organizations have been doing it too. And what's really neat is this has just been happening in the background. We're, we're not allowed to support these people with the funding we have. It just is happening. And what's neat is um, it seems that people are finding that FAST addresses a few different needs. One is that there's obviously a lot of need for access. But two, um, there's a workforce issue right now where there's a lot of turnover. A lot of providers um, you know, don't have a lot of training. Uh, increasingly, people are using providers who um, are uncredentialed or bachelor's level, um, and um, and also access to evidence-based treatment strategies has historically been hard to get, and those treatments are hard to deliver. So um, FAST seems to be uh, meeting some of those needs. Um, I want to talk briefly about standardized measures. And you know, you all may have standardized measures you like. These are just the ones that we like the best for primary care. They're brief, they're free, they really seem to fit the setting. Um, and you may use these for universal care, uh, or I'm sorry, universal screening. You may use these for indicated screening. Um, certainly when a behavioral health provider is providing FAST, we encourage them to use all of these as a way to really efficiently screen and match people to the program that would make, meet their needs the best. And to get on agreement, right, on the same page with families or youth about what the problems are that they're seeing uh, based on this report. And then once they're in care, um, we can use these measures to uh, help with um, deci decide decisions about care, right? So is, is treatment working? Can we discontinue? Is it not working? Do we need to step it up in some fashion? Should we consider adding a medication, right? And using these tools as an efficient way to communicate with other team members, like the primary care provider uh, or outside community providers. Uh, and I'll show you where to find these on our website. Um, and this is my little cartoon version to try to illustrate where, how fast can come into play for primary care providers specifically. So you're meeting with a family in step one and you identify that there's some elevated behavioral health concern, right? Maybe you're doing universal screening or indicated screening, or maybe you're just talking to a family and it's clear that they're having a problem. 
The, then the second step is to use one of our FAST hands outs, handouts. So if it's one of the common concerns like depression or behavior problems or trauma impact or anxiety, you can use one of these handouts. And these are, um, we really try to give away the farm with these handouts. We try to take all the core things that we can from evidence-based treatment and just give it in lay terms, in concrete steps to families so they can actually give a go. They can actually try to make uh, some headway. Uh, it's, it's not the sort of standard, um, you may have a chemical imbalance type of handout. It's, here's what you can try this week. Um, and so hopefully that empowers you. I'll show you these and how they look. Um, and it could be that you have them follow up with you. It could also be that in that moment, uh, you decide to connect them with a provider. And if you have a FAST provider, FAST trained provider on staff, you can make that connection. Um, if you have uh, community resources, you can connect them there. Um, Okay, so let me show, I'm gonna unshare. I'm hoping I can unshare. And then uh, now I'm gonna share with you the FAST website and actually walk you through what you can find there and how to navigate it and show you some of these resources. Okay, I think this is gonna work. Um, Kenton, can you confirm that you're able to see the Google Chrome uh, Fast Approach, First Approach Skills Training? Yes, yeah, for sure. Okay, great. So this is our landing page, and on the landing page, we have information. This is really first, um, first and foremost for the mental health clinicians who are um, delivering brief fast programs. Um, and you can see there's descriptions of the programs. There's uh, each of the materials they might want to use. So there's the two-page uh, resources that primary care providers can use. There's the workbooks. Uh, which in the case of Fast Day are actually things that um, families can use independently. Um, there's oftentimes child or teen versions. There's special handouts that may be, for example, needle phobia. Um, we have sometimes things like brief versions, right? Which are, this is a two page distillation of um, the Fast Anxiety concepts. Uh, we sometimes have FAQs, right? To uh, talk about common challenges or questions with using the programs. So you can see each program has a little blurb. It has the associated materials. Uh, at the bottom of this, we have some other handouts for particular um, uh, kind of concerns. Uh, for example, dealing with screens, uh, motivating teens to reflect on and change their screen habits, dealing with racial stress and trauma. Um, we describe our team, and I just am scrolling down not to make you sick, but to show you where on the landing page we have at the bottom our assessment tool. So you can find a link to all the tools that we recommend. Again, you may have your own, but these are the ones that we like, uh, and we have some engagement resources too. So. That's our landing page, but I wanna show you these other pieces that we've built in more recently. So we have a page for parents and caregivers, and this page has the resources that families could use uh, independently, right? Even without uh, a, a professional um, who is supporting them. And so um, we have them divided up by problem areas. So we have anxiety problems, we have depression problems, trauma, uh, challenging behavior for, for kids and teens. Um, and then we have very similar, uh, one for primary care providers. We didn't want you all or families having to wade through all of these different resources to find the ones that were appropriate for your, your role. Um, but this is the, the page that has primary care provider uh, appropriate tools. Now, all of these are probably more than you can walk through with a family in your brief visits, um, but they are things that you can hand to families to, to look at and give a go. And like I said, you could connect them with resources at that, at that time or potentially have them uh, check back with you and see how it's going. Um, I want to show you these, but first I want to show you the training page. So on our training page, we have those, like I said, the free uh, on-demand pre-recorded training videos to introduce you to the, to the concepts and to the tools that you can use. Um, we have, uh, here's one that uh, is just a 13 minute video that introduces you to the brief handout on supporting families uh, with anxiety. Uh, this might be an interesting, if you're interested in exploring uh, our, our trainings, you might start there and just see uh, an example of what, what our tools are, um, but the full anxiety kind of concepts and, and resources are described here. Um, we talk about our interactive workshops, we talk about our ongoing um, support. Okay, so back to the primary care provider section, I'm just gonna show you an example. Again, I'm trying to run through a lot here, but I wanna get to some research uh, findings uh, as well today. So um, this is an example of a two-pager that primary care providers can use. Uh, we also have behavioral health providers use this on the front end of treatment just to give the overview and actionable steps the families can take. You can see we describe the problem, we define sort of what is, is depression, 
um, what are sort of common um, symptoms so that people can see how that, how, you know, whether that fits with their experience uh, or not. Sorry, try to resize it. Uh, what causes depression? There's so many causes. How depression can make you stuck, right? Because once we're in a depressed mood, it's hard to want to do things that might help the situation. And then what can teens do to feel better? So we have a lot of concrete steps. Uh, we encourage teens to consider maybe one or two things they might try so they don't get overwhelmed. And maybe consider a support person, right, to help them sort of make that change. We start with sleep because, of course, depression can impact sleep, but also sleep can cause depression when it's disrupted, right? So, um, and it's really hard to make changes in your life if your sleep is so uh, disrupted that you're too tired, right? And a lot of sleep deprivation symptoms look a lot like depression, right? Low energy, irritability, uh, low motivation. Um, we also talk about exercise. We talk about finding connection, uh, making space for fun um, and rewarding activities. We talk about solving problems because a lot of teens, uh, their depression stems from a problem that's on their plate that they haven't been able to solve, right? Uh, or goals that they feel like they're, they're not able to uh, make movement on. But we also highlight that anxiety is often a driver of depression. And we encourage, uh, you know, because it's so often the driving force here, uh, we encourage our behavioral health providers and we encourage families to consider, should we treat the anxiety? Because that's probably what's, what's going to need to happen. Or trauma similarly often drives a depression. So when it's clear that a traumatic event or a history of trauma or abuse is really driving that depression, maybe we can deal with that. We can put out that, that the source of the fire, right? Um, and of course, avoiding alcohol and drugs. And then the backside is strategies for caregivers who are often feeling so helpless and disempowered, right? Um, that uh, giving them some strategies they can try. Supporting sleep, oftentimes it does take external structure from a caregiver before that sleep, the sleep can become a healthier pattern. Things like, um, you know, putting a curfew on screens, uh, encouraging, sort of getting active and socializing. A lot of times when a teen is depressed, they're kind of a pain, right? And maybe they're grounded as opposed to being encouraged to get out there and be uh, connected. So this is helpful to reorient sometimes parents. You know, we can't control whether um, maybe our teen has been ditched by their friend group, but we can certainly try to increase the rewards and connection they have in the house uh, and try to connect with them. Uh, we can work on holding our criticism, even though maybe they're falling down on a lot of things that we, we don't like seeing because they're depressed. We can try to really not add or compound the issue by being really critical. We can notice the positive. We can be a good listener. Um, you know, we can deal with screen problems, which may be primary or oftentimes they're secondary, right? Uh, youth are avoiding things and they're burying themselves in screens to avoid their, their feelings or the, the mounting problems that they face. Uh, and then, of course, focusing on safety and medication. So this is just a sample of what the two pagers are. Um, Going to unshare that. Go back to my slides. I know this is a little bit of a whirlwind, but I want to share with you some really exciting uh, actual data um, you might be wondering if I were to use FAST, if we were to sort of implement this, what would happen? And I don't know the answer, but I can tell you a little bit about what happened in um, uh, one um, place. So we have, um, uh, there's uh, a partnership was formed uh, and integrated behavioral health was forged between uh, a mental health agency, a community mental health agency called Hope Sparks, and a pediatrics network uh, called P uh, Pediatrics Northwest. And so um, Peds Northwest is a network of four clinics, 28 physicians, 45,000 active patients in Pierce County, Washington. And um, Hope Sparks, uh, the, the sort of integrated care side is being led by Wendy Pringle. The pediatric side is led by a physician named uh, Marianne Woodruff, and they have partnered with us to really look at what happened, uh, to really collect and look closely at the data, and they, they, they really gathered amazingly careful data on measurement-based care and outcomes uh, and process. So we've been able to, to work with them to see what happened in the first year. Now, they really kicked off their, um, their integrated care at an interesting time. Uh, I don't think they intended to do an entirely telehealth integrated care program, but that's what happened. They kicked it off just as the pandemic was happening, and it became a 100% telehealth integrated care program. And you can see that um, they got a bunch of referrals and a really impressive connection rate uh, of the folks who were referred. 72% um, uh, had an actual visit with a mental health provider and that they also stayed true to the brief care concept. So they limited their care to, um, to three months 
and they um, they had I think an hour assessment uh, initial meeting and then 20 to 30 minute visits were the standard for uh, their follow up and that's consistent with the collaborative care sort of billing approach in Washington that sets face to face time reimbursement at about 30 minutes a week or one hour every two weeks. And you can see, I think the average was pulled up a little bit by this. Uh, there was one family that for some reason got 43 visits, um, but, but most of them uh, were really more in the range of 10. Um, and very frequently, like Sophie's data was saying, that it was even less. Um, and to cut to the punchline, um, we found that, um, that there were significant effects. The, um, the t-tests we did were extremely significant. The effect sizes were um, really strong for behavior problems, for anxiety in kids. Uh, we also saw um, uh, uh, strong effects for um, depression and anxiety. Uh, and um, we were very encouraged by this. Uh, and me, even a little surprised, I was skeptical about what would happen with these brief visits, but it really was powerful. Um, and we surveyed the clinicians and um, they said that they were using FAST and they were really strict. They were really, um, they followed the workbook super carefully, uh, even more carefully than I ever thought uh, people needed to, but they were very careful to use FAST as intended. Um, and they found that uh, according to their clinician's estimation, about 18% of uh, their patients needed additional care after completing FAST. Um, and they were really careful to try to uh, find folks and, and really um, craft the referrals to be folks who could benefit from these brief treatments that were appropriate for the brief treatments um, and, and also ideally in the mild to moderate range. Um, the, we surveyed them uh, using scales on the program's acceptability, appropriateness, feasibility. We got perfect scores from their clinicians. Um, which may reflect the fact that their clinicians were super influential as we developed the programs uh, and helping us craft ones that would fit with their, the parameters of their, their care. Uh, we also assessed usability and cultural responsiveness, and they gave us really strong marks there too. But better than all of that um, is that I recently, just this week, um, I obtained uh, unexpectedly a list of quotes from, um, from families who'd been through the program, and I'm actually just going to let you all read them. Hopefully you can read them. Um, we're going to send out the slides afterwards, so if you didn't read them all, that's fine, because there's another slide, uh, more quotes. Um, let me read these two. So this, um, for, for folks like us, for folks like me especially, this is really, and oh, now my cursor's gone, there we go. Um, this is really the best, uh, the best part of doing the work. Um, and then I, um, I was talking with Wendy Pringle, who, who, like I said, she leads the Hope Spark sides of things. Uh, and she was in a meeting and she was telling folks around the state, she said, it really changes lives. Fast, uh, people's lives are really dramatically different because of it. Um, and so to hear that these brief programs can have such a big impact is extremely gratifying. Um, and of course, we're doing a lot to try to evaluate this. We're working with Sophie uh, on the SCCN uh, project to evaluate how things are going there. We've got some big research grants. We've got some smaller projects, and we have a lot that we're working on. Um, but uh, also, we have Hope Sparks. That was just the first year, so we have all the additional data that we're going to look at next. Um, so um, next, I want to just quickly page through. I just can't see the time here. Page through. These are some slides. You can look at these uh, hopefully afterwards that talk about, you know, what are the core kinds of uh, target problems that these programs are designed for and what are the core interventions that they include. Um, the ages are rough guidelines. Uh, they actually are really quite adaptable to broader age ranges than this. Um, but these are sort of the sweet spot, uh, especially for brief care. Um, the teens program, past trauma is a newer one. Fast early childhood, like I said, it hasn't quite been rolled out yet, but it really fits with the idea of primary care. You know, you have such an outsized role, uh, a really large and wonderful role in the, the early childhood years. And getting upstream is just such a, a perfect uh, opportunity and really fits the fact that we're trying to do brief care, right? We're not trying to recreate the sort of high-end uh, sort of um, 
uh, high intensity care of uh, specialty settings, but trying to get ahead of things and help families uh, in ways that can really pay dividends. Um, so, you know, of course, you can visit um, our website, explore things. Uh, you can do the free video trainings. You can register for live trainings if you're in the state uh, and increasingly out of state. Um, you can contact us and find out about uh, what's happening there. Um, and you can contact us. Uh, we're hoping to get feedback. Uh, we always get feedback uh, from folks and we try to make good use of it uh, quickly. And um, if you're out of state, again, the pre-recorded the pre -recorded trainings are, um, are a great resource. So that's really, um, that's all I had. I think uh, hopefully this gives us lots of time for Q&A. Uh, maybe things have come in the chat that we can. Um... So um, the first question, how do we join a cohort? That is a great question. Um, I would say, so currently we do not have plans for a third cohort, but I will say that we are willing and interested to entertain figuring out a third cohort. We would just need to figure out like the funding sources and all of that. So if anyone is interested in that, feel free to um, email me. I, I'll, I'll put my email address in the chat actually. That may make it easier. So I would say as of right now, we don't have anything planned, but nothing is um, out, of the, out of the possibilities. So, and because, you know, we did partner with, uh, with Sophie and the SCCN to, um, to train the folks in the cohort. Um, that is one part of what we do. We've trained many, many uh, folks outside of the cohort. So uh, while the SCCN offers a really, really rich and intensive um, uh, level of support for, for practices building up their um, integrated care program, if you're just looking to train um, clinicians and fast, that's, uh, more easily obtained. We do that on a regular basis outside of the cohort. I'm not seeing another question. Do you see one, Kenton? I'm seeing some questions here, but my chat box is so darn small. Uh, let me see if I can make it bigger so I can actually read these. Um, let's see. Is there any information okay. or data about parents, patients, who were given the handouts and a couple uh, minute intro from PCPs versus people undergoing the full four plus sessions. Oh, I would love to have those data. In fact, we tried to submit a grant similar to this um, to PCORI and they um, they didn't fund us. So we're, we're trying to, we do wanna test out these different models, these different stages of care. Uh, and we don't actually know how many folks um, are benefiting just from the brief handouts. I think in this moment in time, we're really happy to create access to something, um, even, uh, even if it's just an educational handout, not knowing just uh, what impact it has. We wanna empower families as best we can. Um, but that, but yes, we are trying to test uh, everything we can about this. And that's a great question, right? What can we see even just with a primary care uh, intervention um, or primary care provider? And I see Kanisha has a great question. Are there resources to provide strategies for adolescents with self-harm behaviors? So the FAST safety program that we're developing really carefully um, is designed to um, support that. The, I think we're in a tough spot with, uh, with safety concerns like self-harm and suicidality, which is that um, sometimes they need a lot more support than we can do in primary care in a brief way. But it's true that we're often first, we, we're often the first people to encounter those kids, right? And we may need to be a bridge, we may need to support them. And a lot of times they don't need DBT. They don't need some really intensive intervention. They just need a conversation, maybe a motivational conversation, maybe uh, identifying the downsides of this and then uh, identifying some coping skills that hopefully can work as well without the sort of downsides of self-harm. Um, and uh, maybe some attention to what triggered it, right? If, whether it's you know uh, trauma or abuse or uh, a challenging environment. So anyway, it's a tough um, brief program to create, but we are trying to do some, uh, we're trying really hard to create something that can meet that need in a brief way that's also safe and appropriate. And in this case, well-tested, because we don't want to roll out something. Uh, it feels a little easier to give good strategies for, uh, for anxiety, for example, um, but for kids who are self-harming or suicidal, we, um, we're really wanting to um, do a really high level of evaluation on the front end um, before beginning trainings on that. And then do you, any clinics train MAs or nurses already in their clinics to do the FAST interventions? Uh, and MAs being uh, medical assistants. We, um, this is a great question. We designed these programs with the idea of task sharing, the idea that 
um, non-licensed mental health professionals would be able to do them. We try to make them so easy that they could really be picked up by other folks. We haven't done it yet, though, uh, in part because um, the opportunity hasn't presented itself. And also, um, our training models are really brief. And so we want to make sure that there's enough support in place for those providers without credentials, without sort of that, ba that background training to be successful and, and not make mistakes. Um, so I think um, we are, uh, I think, open to partnering with organizations, um, and we haven't done it yet uh, to explore the, the potential and also to think about what would be needed to uh, help these models be implemented by, um, by, uh, by folks such as that. If the FAST safety course could address chronic versus acute suicidality, that would be very helpful. Yes, I'm. I'm kind of curious to know a little bit more about what Wendy's saying there. I think um, one one piece of this that we're thoughtful about is that a lot of times we're looking at acute suicidality and support, and a lot of our screening measures only looks at a recent time window. But I think there are a lot of kids who have some vague um, sort of periodic or low lying kind of um, you know suicidality, and I think. Uh, our hope is that we could actually address that, that that would be something where maybe they're not an acute risk, but there is some, you know, there is some indication that that's on, that's, that's going on. And we want to sort of try to prevent that from turning into something more significant. Uh, if it is really chronic severe suicidality, that may be something that we would refer to a more intensive treatment program. But if it's a chronic or sort of non-acute, but background suicidality, that, that may be a good, uh, that may be something we can target. But again, that's still taking shape. Do the training videos provide examples of how to utilize the model during brief 20 minute in parentheses primary care visits by primary care providers? They don't. Well, um, let's see. The training videos are really, um, at this point, the ones on our website are designed for behavioral health providers largely. Uh, and they don't give examples of how a provider might, a uh, primary care provider might briefly introduce them. Um, and um, so that's a need still to be developed. Maybe Thatcher, you can work with us on that. Um, but I guess at this point, uh, we're gonna rely on um, primary care providers adeptness with giving handouts of all kinds and hope that, um, hope that uh, you can um, maybe wrestle those into use. But, but I do think that there are, so for example, that 13 minute video that looks at the brief uh, fast A um, uh, handout, that could be an example of something that you might um, you might use. So I, I guess what I'm picturing is that many primary care providers are going to be busy. They're going to be doing a well child check. Maybe the kid has a sore throat and then anxiety is coming up. But if they're visiting you specifically to deal with their anxiety or depression, it may well be possible for you to actually walk through some of the handouts and concepts with them. And, and in that case, um, uh, that's an example of maybe something that we should try to create, uh, um, you know, maybe modeling or examples of how to do that. But um, Thatcher, perhaps uh, we could talk more about it if you have an interest. A follow up from Wendy. Oh, uh, let's see. Outline a way to screen from chronic versus acute imminent. That would help clinicians determine the next steps. Yeah, so I think one of the big needs that we're seeing, um, and my colleague Jen Blossom is really heading this up along with some, uh, some of our uh, really amazing expert folks at the Crisis Care Clinic at Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, but there is clearly triaging and deciding what level of care and what next steps are needed is a big piece of what primary care-based uh, uh, providers are needing. So that is one intention, is that this is, uh, it's going to be a bit of a Swiss Army knife. It's going to help you hopefully determine who you can support and give you some brief tools to maybe make a difference and also maybe some guidance as to who needs that higher level that can be hard to get. Another follow-up was just mostly we are using the CSSRS, but sometimes the full Columbia takes much more than 15 to 30 minutes. Um, so I'm going to put in the fast email, which goes right to our group, and uh, that, that way it will include more than just me. Um, but uh, Thatcher, hopefully we can follow up. I'd be really uh, excited to, um, to talk more. Uh, as far as the Columbia, well, I'm also looking at um, Sophie, because I know you have involvement with the crisis care clinic, so you're free, feel free to weigh in as well. Um, I think, um, let's see, looking at the scope of Wendy's questions here. 
I think you're, you know, the, the Columbia, um, as you're using it, makes a lot of sense. A lot of practices are using the ASQ. I know that that's been the focus at Seattle Children's. Um, okay, and... Um, Can you explain again the specific training and resources that are available to clinicians out of state? Handouts and training videos, but no additional training at this time, correct? Um, we so the handouts and videos are definitely available, um, and there we are. Um, we have worked out um, a way to provide training that is outside of Washington State funding dollars. Um, so it would be sort of um, funded by it, people would have to pay um, to cover the time of the training. So we've worked out a model to do that, and we haven't scheduled these trainings yet, um, but we're very close to scheduling dates. So if you have an interest, you can email us, and we will. Um, uh, we will put you in that group of folks who have expressed interest in that because we do have quite a few folks out of state who have been asking for for the training and we do intend to provide it um, probably in the new year uh, at this point. So are there I, any I more guess, questions look, or? Yeah, it looks like we might be wrapping up. I don't know if that's true, but I just want to encourage folks to please um, share any feedback you have. You don't have to be in Washington State to give us feedback on how these tools are working and ways they could be improved. And like I said, we've iterated them uh, hundreds of times, and I'm sure we'll do it hundreds more, and um, we would love to be able to uh, better meet the needs out there as you see them. It's our pleasure. So thrilled to have all everyone here today and, and your interest. Well, do contact us, please send us an email and we will do our best to meet the needs uh, however we can. All right, well, it looks like it's wrapping up. Nate and Sophie, so much appreciate your time and your expertise and thank you for spending the evening with us. And uh, everyone feel free to visit their website or to uh, reach out for the uh, general email that uh, Nate had uh, provided in the chat box. So thanks everyone, have a great evening and uh, everybody be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you.